Hello, hello, hello. Happy Monday evening. So, um, you know, I really wanted to come live today and talk about the reality of emotional eating, right? That's really what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about my struggles with emotional eating. So I've kind of hijacked my son's room tonight um, because everyone is basically using all the other rooms in the house. So I wanted some privacy to talk about this because this can be a very sensitive subject. Um, because I'm going to share some things that are real life, some things that I actually have never shared before, and why I self-sabotage and why I struggle with emotional eating and why I am in therapy to deal with these things. So when I was 13 years old, I started struggling with emotional eating. Um, I didn't really have full out binge and purge, but I would binge. I would binge and I would binge and I would binge, but I would never purge. So I would just... Um, basically eat, 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 eat. And then for a few days, I just would eat nothing at all. Then I would eat, 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 McDonald's, chips, hide it. Um, that was really what I did when I was 13. And obviously when I had a driver's license, um, I had a car to drive. I had my parents' 1988 GMC Sierra. It was two-tone brown. Um, when I really was able to drive, it got even worse because I would go through the McDonald's drive through almost every single day and eat it, eat it, eat it, hide it, and then eat dinner with my family. That is just what I did. Um, a lot of it had to do with I was in a competitive horseback rider when I was a teenager. I basically, I started riding horses when I was seven, got my first horse at nine. When I was um, about 13, that's actually when we started competing for real. Uh, we eventually bought a horse that was a multi-time national champion uh, because we wanted to win. And it was a lot, a lot of pressure but many wins, many, much success, but it was very, very stressful. And I did go see a therapist at that time for competition anxiety because I would have major anxiety attacks. Um, at like 15, 16, 17 years old, I would have major anxiety attacks. So I went to a therapist to deal with those anxiety attacks. The thing was that that therapist was a friend of my parents. So it was really hard to really get to the root of what was going on. And I don't think I even knew what the problem was. Oh, then I, I was a very shy person. Lots of people thought I was stuck up while I was a teenager. So I, I had just a few close friends. You know, I dated guys off and on, but I didn't really have a serious boyfriend. I didn't drink. I didn't do any of those things in high school because I had plans to go to vet school. To go to Madison, go to vet school. So, of course, my grades, my extracurriculars, um, earning, working as a groom so I could keep my horses. And I worked at horse shows in the summer. Um, this is really was what I did. I didn't go to prom. You know, there were, I skipped my eighth grade graduation. You know, there were just things that were way more important to me. And when I went to college, I actually went to college five hours away. I didn't end up going to vet school. I wanted to be a horse trainer. That is what I wanted to do. Uh, so I went to school five hours away. You know, I was like, nobody knows me here. I can be whoever I want to be. But I was still deathly, deathly shy. Super, super introvert. So I used alcohol <laughs> to be more outgoing. Now, this is, this is just a hard story to tell. So I get a little emotional. So this was really a hard time for me because I was using alcohol to be more outgoing. I was trying to be somebody that I wasn't. Um, you know, I ended up um, basically flunking out of school. I couldn't pass animal physiology. I took it twice. I got F twice. I changed my major to business. I was part of the theater program. I just, I couldn't find where I was really meant to be. And in my fifth year of college, I actually ended up getting kicked out because I just stopped going to classes. So I ended up with a, like a zero GPA that semester. And obviously you don't go to classes, you don't take tests, you don't hand in anything. Um, you fail every single class. Um, so then basically I was cut off. It was like, figure it out yourself. You just screwed yourself over at 23 years old. So I moved to Minneapolis and got a job at the airport. And got an apartment for $550 a month at the airport. Um, but I was still struggling. I was still drinking too much. Um, that time, this is something that um, I never really shared with anyone except for my husband. When I was 23, I actually ended up getting pregnant. 
It was with my ex-roommate's boyfriend. Yes, was not a very nice person in my 20s. Um, you know, and that is just what happened. I got pregnant and then I ended up having a miscarriage. It was hard because the only person that knew about this baby was the guy who had got me pregnant. My parents didn't know, my friends didn't know, nobody knew. And I basically had a miscarriage in my toilet in my apartment. Um, I didn't want anybody to know. I hid it and I didn't really tell anybody until I started with my new therapist. I've had multiple other therapists because lots of other things have gone on in my life. I have, um, I was in a domestic violence relationship after that miscarriage. Um, I ended up going to Arizona for a year to try to get away from that relationship after the miscarriage. Um, but I hated in Arizona, it was too hot. I missed my family, so after a year I came back and I moved in with this guy that I actually left to get away from. And that's when I found out his true colors. He was a drug dealer. He was using marijuana. He was using cocaine. He was growing marijuana in the closet. Um, you know, he was verbally abusive. He was physically abusive. Basically, I worked two jobs. I worked customer service at a bank and I worked at Victoria's Secret at Mall of America, basically so I could pay our rent. Um, our other two roommates and himself used me financially. Um, you know, we had basically stopped being intimate, um, but I didn't leave because he cut me off from all my friends. He cut me off from my family. You know, that's what abusers do. Um, I was doing drugs. I was drinking. I was just in a very, very bad place. And then, oh, guess what? Pregnant again. Um, and, you know, we said, I'll change. Things will be different. We'll get married. We'll get our own place. And, you know, you can go back to school and finish your degree. You know, we got this. The first time he hit me when I was pregnant, I was out. I was done. I got as much stuff as I could into my car and I left. I drove from Minneapolis to Lake Geneva, called my parents on the way, and I said, this is what's really been going on. I told them the honest truth. They said, you ever go back there, you cannot come home. So, you know, I went, moved in with my parents at 26, five months pregnant, um, had really been getting medical attention because I didn't have health insurance. Um, as I said, I was not a good person in my twenties, but this baby, I was, I didn't want to be a parent, but I'm like this baby, I'm going to keep this baby. I'm going to be the best mom I can be. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to figure out what I want to do. I'm going to take care of this baby on my own. And that was my intention at 26 years old. I'm like, I'm done with this. I'm done with the drinking. I'm done with the drugs. I'm done with the time. I'm done with guys. I'm done. That was really where I'd hit my limit. I was just done. So, you know, I moved back in with my parents. You know, he just didn't contact me anymore. I basically, I turned his phone off um, and I stopped all communication with him. Um... You know, when I went to have the baby, I was stupid and told him the name of the father, which I honestly should have said I didn't know because then he was back in our lives, right? This abusive drug dealer, drug addict guy that was eight years older than me was back in my life. Obviously, he was still in Minnesota. I was in Lake Geneva, so I was in southeast Wisconsin. He was in Minneapolis. Um, at least I think that time he was living in Stillwater with his mom. Um, and... He was back in our lives all of a sudden. Um, he would come and have visitation every other month for a weekend. They would go to a hotel and he had to have somebody supervising him because he admitted in court that he uses drugs. Um, but he tried to tell everybody that I was bipolar, that I was mentally unstable, all these things that were not even true. Um, yeah, I had a lot of problems, but mental health was not one of them. Um, you know, I had was seeing a counselor. I was going to a domestic violence support group. You know, I was doing the best I could do. I ended up having a social worker um, when I was on state assistance. Um, and she was the worst social worker ever. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be a social worker. That is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change people's lives. I'm going to make a difference. So when my son was two months old, I was going to go to UW-Whitewater for social work bringing in my overall 1.65 GPA with me. Um, you know, Whitewater really didn't want any part of me, but they let me take two classes to prove if I could do it. I took intro to social work and some government class. 
I got an A both classes. They let me come back. Um, I ended up graduating with my bachelor's degree with honors, even coming in with that super low GPA. Um, I excelled in social work. It was just my calling. I ended up being accepted to a super prestigious public school, my only university, for my master's degree, which was mistake number one. I should have waited a year and gone to UW Milwaukee, a lot cheaper, um, and not the $100,000 of debt that came along with that private college. But I was going to be a school social worker. I was going to make a difference in the lives of kids who whose families don't have it together. But getting a job in school social work is impossible. In my undergrad, I interned at Walworth County Child Protective Services. So I ended up working for the Bureau of Milwaukee Child Welfare in Milwaukee doing child protection investigations. So that is the job I ended up getting outside of college while I was trying to find a job that's when Beachbody kind of fell in my lap. Um, during all this time, you know, I had gone to therapy, I got to support groups, I'd done everything that I thought I needed to, to have a good life. You know, I was, I had a, the big girl job, I had um, Beachbody, I had workouts I loved, my, I was losing my baby weight finally. You know, everything was so, so great. And finally, I met this guy. You know, I met this guy at this time in my life where I had fought so hard. My son had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I had basically been like, no more visits for him and my son and his biological father because he just didn't know how to take care of diabetes. And I'm like, no way. We need to stop visits until he takes the education he needs. And the court went with it and his visits were stopped. And he actually hasn't seen his biological father um, in nine years, basically, since I met my husband. Um, but our relationship did not go that smoothly to begin with. I was so damaged from the abuse. And there were things that I just hadn't dealt with. Why I pushed guys away, which I'd always done. Because in college, I was actually um, engaged to somebody who cheated on me. So, you know, that really, really damaged me. And it just made me pick bad guys. It made me push the good ones away. So I went to therapy again to try to deal with why I was pushing people away. You know, we really processed the domestic violence. I thought I finally processed the anxiety I had been experienced. You know, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder. I was taking medications. You know, I thought I had really, really figured it out. And then, you know, things happen. You know, we got married. We were happy. We were great. We we're going to have twins. And then one of the twins died, you know, and that really, really led to more depression, more self-sabotage, more emotional eating. Basically, I had um, 65 pounds to lose, um, like when I was cleared to work out after the twins, I had like 65 pounds to lose. And today I'm at 60 pounds to lose. That tells you like where my journey has been these last four years, basically I've let my emotional eating take over. I actually had gained and had more weight to lose. I've actually lost about 10 pounds since I started back in therapy and actually working on the real issues. So what are my real issues? How am I solving this problem? You know, this is a woe is me story. This is all the bad things, all the bad things, right? But now I'm going to tell you how I'm fixing it. Still not perfect yet, but how I'm fixing it. So I have a therapist who specializes in um, emotional eating and child loss connected to emotional eating um, and why I emotionally eat. And this is just someone that specializes in that. So we do teletherapy um, every two weeks and we're really processing through all of the things, right? The major things that I have that affects me, that makes me self-sabotage, makes me self-sabotage, makes me emotionally eat is stems back from when I was five years old. So I was adopted. Basically, I was a month old. I was adopted and I learned I was adopted when I was five and my parents were going to adopt my brother. That's when I learned I was adopted and you're already feeling that you were unwanted by your parents, but now your current parents are getting another baby. That So I've always had this mentality that I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to be in my family. I'm not good enough to win at the national level in horses. I'm not good enough to get that prestigious social work job. 
I'm not good enough to progress where I want to be in my business. I'm not good enough to lose this baby weight and be the size I want to be. I'm not good enough to keep my husband, to stay married. I'm not good enough to deserve this life that we built. That is just where I've been at is that I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to even be a parent to the kids that I have because God felt I wasn't so good. I was not good enough. So he took one away. Like that was what I really had to process through, right? And that is big stuff. Um, I never processed the miscarriage that I basically hid from everyone except for my husband. My husband knows about it because um, him and his first wife had multiple miscarriages. So he knows about this miscarriage, but guys, my parents don't even know about this. <laughs> they aren't on Instagram. Um, but like nobody knew. Like I didn't tell my best friend. Like I didn't tell anybody. And hiding that from everybody, because even though it was like a miscarriage, I still felt guilt from it because I really didn't want the baby. Let's just be honest. It was with my ex-roommate's boyfriend. Like, that's shame right there. And the shame and hiding it and hiding it for so many years. Just, I'm not good enough. It added on. And like, so that was 17 years ago. And I've been holding that in for 17 years. All the other therapists that I went to, I didn't tell any of them about that. Like, nobody. Because I just felt shame. I felt like God had punished me. Same thing with my da- losing my daughter. I felt like God was punishing me. You know, for some bad thing that I did, you know. And not wanting that baby. Well, at that time, it was 14 years ago. 13 years ago. Not wanting that baby. That... I was being punished and I was not good enough to keep that baby, you know, because I was an alcoholic at the time. I was still calling my parents to help me pay my bills because I would work and then I would use the money to buy alcohol or to go shopping or I would max out all my credit cards because I had no concept of money in my 20s, none. Um, so all these things that I just hit and I'm like, oh God, this is punishing me. Uh, I had a hard time even going to church. I'm going to be honest. We don't go to church right now because I'm just having a hard time. And I have to get through this with my therapist before I can put myself back into that. Um, into that because I want to go back to my church. I really, really do. But I've just been so in here just trying to fix it, right? Because that is really what I'm doing because you've had these feelings before, I'm going to be honest, you need to go to therapy. And you need to be honest with your therapist about what's really going on because I was dishonest um, about my past with three different therapists. I just, how is therapy going to help you if you're not 100% honest on what really happened? So if you have these problems, if you self-sabotage, if you emotionally eat, if you have these feelings of not being good enough, you really, really, really need to process this through journaling. Therapy is optimal. I am a huge component of therapy. I'm a social worker, so I know for me to help other people, I have to help myself. Honestly, I am on antidepressants. That's just what I need to be on my game. But not everybody needs their needs depre- uh, antidepressants. But if you really have this strong of feeling, if you are really feeling this about yourself and you keep going in the same cycle of self-sabotage, you keep going in the same cycle of the emotionally, the binging, the hiding it, because that is what I do. I binge and then I hide what I had. Um, Therapy is the answer, guys. You know, find a really great therapist. Like I said, my therapist specifically is this problem. And me and her have a great relationship. I've been able to really open up to her. There's nothing that I've hidden from her. And that is key, you guys. So, you know, every day is not easy. I still am struggling. I still am struggling because, you know, I lost three and a half pounds and then I self-sabotaged last week. But you know what? I couldn't work out today because I was up every two hours with my son's blood sugar. But I have every intention of going to bed early tonight getting up, starting week four in my program, getting it done, getting up on early on Saturday to make sure I get all the workouts for the week in. So my daughter has her first dance class on Saturday morning. That's exciting. And I'm hoping that by March, we're back at church. That's the goal, to be back at church by March. That's my goal, to work through enough of the stuff where I feel worthy enough to go back to church, right? 
because I just feel like I blame God so much for the bad things that have happened to me. And God wouldn't have given me these things if he knew I couldn't handle it, right? Because he knows I'm a strong person and he knows that I can kick ass and take names and be amazing. So that's where I'm at. Um, have a coaching event tomorrow night, 7.30. So about this time tomorrow night, I'm going to come and talk specifically about coaching, how you earn. Uh, I'm going to do it on Facebook as well. I think I'm going to come live on Instagram tomorrow as well. Um, I'm to probably do it in this room, actually. <laughs> this is actually kind of a nice room to do live in. I can use the desk lamp to make my face look bright and happy. Um, and then... Uh, a week from today, we start prep for my next Get Fit at the Bar. We're going to have a great time. The program is absolutely amazing. I've gotten great results so far, so now I just got to tighten it up, tighten in the nutrition this week, and have a great week. So happy Monday, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope this was helpful. Um, I know I kind of went on and on, but I want to make sure I'm paying transparent with you guys and my therapist really said I need to share this with somebody else besides her and my husband so I feel like sharing this with you guys just makes us so much closer and makes you understand where I'm coming from and the work I'm trying to do both as a social worker and as a health and nutrition coach so hope everybody has a great Monday night time to watch The Little Mermaid with my daughter